Beyond the Bony Labyrinth. Podcast on Music and Philosophy by Laura Wijkmans. Episode 2 Darling, they're playing our tune in DTP RT. Play it once, Sam, for all time's sake. Play it, Sam. Play as time goes by. There's a good chance that the tune will already have started sounding in your head. As time goes by. Maybe Ingrid Bergman's shiny eyes took onto mind, the thoughtful expression on her face reflecting the memories that play in her head with the music. That is what this episode is about, about memories associated with music, how music can play with our memories, and a later episode also about the question whether music itself can represent the mental process of remembering. Music as sounding memory. That famous scene from the film Casablanca is a classic situation, not to say cliché, but an important, meaningful cliché. A particular song, a particular piece of music, evokes strong associations with a past experience. A moment when that music sounded, which that music was part of. For Ilse, Ingrid Bergman, and that is being together with Rick, Humphrey Bogart, in Paris, shortly before the German invasion of 1940. Casablanca, released in 1943, is one of the most beloved films ever made, but not a masterpiece according to many critics. Especially the plot and the characters have their share of faults. But the film does have the impact of a masterpiece, despite being full of clichés, or precisely because of it. In a widely read essay, Umberto Eco raised the question of what makes Casablanca such a timelessly fascinating film, even though its artistic quality is actually only mediocre, uh, very mediocre according to Eco. The answer lies in the fact that Casablanca is a haphazardly assembled collection of film clichés, a tangle, a dance, even an orgy of the kind of patterns and situations and that make good stories. The clichés are talking among themselves, according to Eco, and in this way they have an unintended joint effect. And Eco concludes that two clichés make us laugh, a hundred clichés move us. That is a catchy phrase which may sound convincing, but whether it is true, I have my doubts about that. There are lots of pulp fiction rife with clichés. It is precisely what makes it pulp fiction. And if it is effective, it is not because the clichés are so many, but because they are used effectively. Play it, Sam. Play as time goes by. What Echo leaves out of his discussion is the very substantial part music plays in the film. Except that he mentions as one of those clichés they are playing our song. A shared memory is awakened by music. In this case, as time goes by, the song that represents the love affair between Rick and Ilse.
they're playing our song. It is one of the stereotypes this film makes use of. I don't know where Echo got the expression from, but one prominent source is a 1978 book by music psychologist John Bulls Davies. In this he speaks of the darling they're playing our tune phenomenon, in short, a DTBRT. I quote Davies. The lady from whose mouth this apocryphal saying is supposed to have emanated has acquired a specific emotional response to a specific tune simply because she heard it at a time when some other pleasurable business was taking place at some time in the past. Now the tune itself makes her feel good uh, simply because she associates it with the previous pleasant experiences. Note, Davies assumes that the utterance is made by a woman, that a woman is more likely to recognize our tune and give expression to that. Women, this is a traditional stereotype, are more prone to sentimentality than men. Now there is more wrong with that concept, DTPOT, than a slightly sexist slant. And Davies surprisingly introduces it in the context of mental conditioning. He speaks of a specific emotional response, developed simply because the conditioned lady heard that tune during a particular pleasurable experience. A matter, apparently, of stimulus and response, as with Pavlov's dog, which starts drooling at... No, not the ringing of a bell, although I suppose it could have been that. Pavlov used a ticking metronome and a harmonium, two musical devices with an already somewhat dubious reputation. For the dog, the sound is a stimulus that, through conditioning, habituation, triggers an involuntary reflex, namely the production of saliva, only because he is accustomed to the sound being followed by juicy chunks, which then fell out of his throat through a hole, because Pavlov had a lucrative trade in dog drool, for scientific and medicinal purposes. The same process of conditioning, Davies thought, causes people to experience a certain emotion with certain music, because in the past that music was part of a certain emotive episode. Even if that experience was unique, unlike Pavlov's dog. DTPOT was somewhat jokingly introduced by Davies. Nevertheless, it has become a technical term in music psychology. This does not refer exclusively to shared experiences of heterosexual couples, but to conditioned associations to a musical stimulus in general. The hour tune scenario, then, is a special case of a general phenomenon. Characteristic is the behaviorist approach, which has not yet completely disappeared from music psychology. Music is a stimulus that triggers a mental response. Spontaneously and involuntarily, and just as you may start salivating at the sight of good food. But that response does come to consciousness, therefore the experience can also be deliberately sought, as is the case with Ilza in Casablanca. Play it once, Sam. For all time's sake. Play it, Sam. Play as time goes by. Music, unlike the ticking metronome, is not an arbitrary, meaningless stimulus. To become our tune, it will first have to be a tune, music. Since music is never neutral, without expression and meaning, its character will have to be relatable to the quality of the remembered experience. As this song, as time goes by, can fulfill its function in the film partly because it is about time slipping by, and about things that don't change nevertheless, especially love. Davies does admit that the emotional connection to music can go deeper than random stimulation. In this context he speaks of music, tunes, of the DTPOT type. Music from the repertoire of songs for swinging lovers, ideally suited as a hook for emotional or sentimental associations. Songs for Swinging Lovers, and the expression is taken from a 1956 album by Frank Sinatra. If the night 
nightingales could sing like you They'd sing much sweeter than they do For you brought a new kind of love to me Why is this function, evoking memories, attributed specifically to music? There are other types of stimulus, uh, the taste of a cookie dipped in tea, or seeing something like a pattern of black stripes, the two classic examples, the types of stimulus that can trigger a strong associative response through conditioning. An important factor, I think, is that music takes place in time. It allows us to go along with it, uh, to participate by singing and moving, internally or externally, in a structured experience. Even in memory, music has a time lapse. And just ask yourself how fast you can play a tune in your head. This may be part of an explanation why music can have such miraculously powerful effects in Alzheimer's patients, who seem to be extinguished and barely able to communicate, but suddenly revive when they hear familiar music. Although most of their memory seems to have been wiped out, musical memories persist, and when these are activated, part of the personality resurfaces along with them. Music here seems to be a key to emotions that in turn evoke memories, or vice versa. And with that, music seems to have a special ability to hold our personality, the body and mind, together. With its regular pulls and patterns of expectation, music can, for as long as it lasts, give coherence to what would otherwise be for the patient an endless series of isolated moments. This allows other memories to emerge from their frozen, timeless state and become a lived experience again. And that doesn't apply only to people with memory loss. That ability of music to help structure experience over time is one of the most important factors in musical enjoyment and what it contributes to our well-being. I wasn't sure you were the same. Let's see the last time we met. Was La Bella Roa. How nice, you remembered. But of course that was the day the Germans marched into Paris. Not an easy day to forget. No. I remember every detail. The Germans wore grey, you wore blue. Yes, I put that dress away. When the Germans march out, I'll wear it. Memories evoked by music, one usually thinks of positive memories. Nostalgia. This is related to a general tendency to think about music as something essentially good, and beautiful or otherwise of value. And yet, for many at least, there is also music you hate. Ugly or poorly made music, a music that expresses negativity. And music that is not necessarily bad or ugly, but has become associated with negative experiences through Pavlovian conditioning. Contrary to what the DTPOT scenario suggests, musical memories need not be pleasant. Music can be associated with traumatic experiences. This is nothing else than the DTPOT effect, but with the contrary emotional value. The enemy's tune. Again, Casablanca offers a textbook example, Die Wacht am Rhein, a Deutschland über alles. The tunes of the enemy. In Rick's Café, a musical battle is being fought, Die Wacht am Rhein against the French Marseillaise, two marching songs competing. Wait. DTPOT situations are recognizable from everyday life and also very useful as a dramaturgical ingredient for drama, opera and film. Hence, it has become a cliché. Music that triggers memories, or conversely is recalled by events, lends itself perfectly to opera, which has provided all sorts of devices exploited by Hollywood composers. 
There are countless examples of this. Let me choose one that bears some striking similarities to Casablanca and Le Pêcheur de Perle, The Pearl Fishers by Georges Bizet. One similarity is that this too has a script or a libretto that was sloppily cobbled together. But where Casablanca has become an accidental masterpiece thanks to all sorts of factors, the same cannot be said of the Pearl Fishers. Not even Bizet's music can change that. This too refutes Eco's theory. For where a hundred clichés need not produce a masterpiece, sometimes one or two clichés already draw out the tears. As here, with the famous duet for tenor and baritone, Au fond du temple saint. Together they recall a memory. In the depths of the temple they catch sight of a priestess. Both instantly fall in love, feel their friendship is at stake and decide to sacrifice love for friendship. And that is the moment recalled. Again, there is a similarity to Casablanca. Uh, two men fall in love with the same woman, and it ends with one of them sacrificing himself in order to stop the enemy and allow the others to escape. Rick as baritone, and Victor as tenor. Ilza is here the soprano, in this case a priestess who forsakes her duty and goes on the run with one of the two, the tenor of course, because he can sing in octaves with the soprano. In this case, of course, their tune is their tune, only for us, the audience. It represents the shared experience in the weird way of operatic convention. Several times during the course of the opera, we are reminded of that duet and that moment in the past. It has its culmination in the finale, the moment when the baritone sacrifices himself. It gains an extra dimension, because even in the duet this music is already the evocation of a memory. So the return of that music is actually a memory of a memory. Rather subtle for a cliché. Adieu. Leila. Je t'aime. Leila. 
This is how I knew the end of the opera. Yet it is not the original ending composed by Bizet, it was adapted 30 years later by Benjamin Godard. Even the famous duet, by the way, was changed and, in my opinion, improved by Godard according to the principle, a great tune is better sung twice. And although I am snob enough to turn up my nose at such sentimentality, it may still give me goosebumps. Play it again, Georges. This was episode 2 of Beyond the Bony Labyrinth. Sources for music and text are found in the show notes.